Secretary of State Rex Tillerson will meet with foreign leaders next month in a show of solidarity against North Korea's nuclear program. Our series, Issues That Matter, this morning looks at the tensions between the U.S. and North Korea. The standoff is one of President Trump's biggest challenges overseas. North Korea fired a missile into the Sea of Japan last night. Things have reached a rather dangerous level. Following the tragic death of Otto Warmbier, the Trump administration is considering a ban on American travel to North Korea. Do you believe the North Koreans should be held responsible for his death? Yes. Kim Jong-un celebrated what would be Pyongyang's first ICBM test. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. North Korea has declared that it has completed its nuclear weapons program. It claims the rocket is capable of striking the entire mainland United States. Where are we with North Korea right now? Uh, we're getting close to a military conflict. We're running out of time. America and its allies will take all necessary steps to achieve a denuclearization and ensure that this regime cannot threaten the world. CBS News senior national security contributor Michael Morell was acting and deputy director of the CIA. He is host of the Intelligence Matters podcast. New Yorker staff writer Evan Osnos traveled to North Korea on assignment for the magazine. And he made it back safely to the table. We're very glad about that. Your article is very harrowing to read a couple of, in a couple of places. But let's start with you, Mike, because President Trump has told aides that he will be handily judged by how he handles North Korea. Do you think his tough talk helps Rocket Man, locked and loaded, fury like you've never seen? Is that helpful to this conversation? I think if you're going to make a threat, right, if you're going to say that if you don't give up your nuclear program, that we are going to take military action, that you have better already decided that you're going to do that. Because if North Korea doesn't blink and they move forward and you end up doing nothing, right, you've lost a tremendous amount of credibility. Um, and I think the, the, the language in that respect um, is dangerous. Does anybody think North Korea is going to blink? I, I don't think so. I think this this program is incredibly important to him from a security perspective mm -hmm. and from a political perspective. He's not going to stop until he has demonstrated the capability of putting a U.S. city at risk of, of a nuclear attack. And, and Evan, we know that a U.N. undersecretary, Mr. Feltman, has been to North Korea, laid out a couple of different proposals, essentially talks, right? The South Koreans, the president told me he wants uh, bilateral talks. The North Koreans now are saying no. We're yeah. not we're interested in going that, which suggests that there are just more missile tests ahead, correct? The North Koreans right now actually feel like they're in a pretty good place. You know, they've been able to steadily advance the progress of this program to their desired objective. And what is their objective? It's what Michael mentioned. It's the idea that they could actually hit an American city. They're not there yet. Best assessments are they could be there within a year. But their goal is to put off the negotiations long enough so that they're in the best possible position and then get to the table. Evan, you write that to go between Washington and Pyongyang at this nuclear moment is to be struck most of all by how little the two understand each other. That's pretty discouraging. Yeah, I have to tell you, that was one of the big surprises for me. We've got incredibly smart people in our country working on North Korea all the time. And the reality is that North Korea is enveloped in a kind of fog. That's actually the term they use. Kim Jong-il said we should surround ourselves, make ourselves impenetrable to the outside world. And to some degree, they've succeeded. And one of the ways we could cut through that would be to have greater diplomatic contact, some sort of dialogue. James Clapper, former director of national intelligence, says if we don't have any sort of conversation going, we are, in fact, flying blind. It's in our advantage. To you also write, Evan, that between the two leaders, between Kim Jong-un and President Trump, there are only seven years of political experience and that you're dealing with two very volatile personalities. But it's interesting to hear North Koreans' view of Americans and President Trump. What did you learn about that? And when I was in Pyongyang and I was with... Uh, some foreign ministry officials whose job it is is to read Donald Trump's Twitter feed, listen to his speeches, try to analyze the American government. And what they said was, frankly, we're mystified. We can't figure out if he is, as they put it, irrational or whether he's proceeding down a subtle strategy that's leading them to an objective. So when we send mixed messages, when we send confusing messages, they're not quite sure what to make of it. Michael, one of the interesting things, too, as you try and 
contain North Korea some way and, and increase sanctions, the Russians have actually increased their trade with North Korea. In fact, shipping over enough oil that the price of oil has gone down in North Korea. And I asked the president's national security about that, advisor about that yesterday. Has President Trump asked President Putin to stop those oil shipments? What is Russia doing? Um, Russia's strategy globally is to undermine the United States wherever it can. So Russia's, Russia's interest here is to make, just simply make our life more difficult, um, make it more likely that we will not be successful um, in North Korea. That's what Vladimir Putin is trying to do. Mm -hmm. So what is Kim's end game here? If you ask people in Pyongyang, really cut through what it is that they're trying to achieve, the yeah. thing they return to over and over again is they want to avoid being Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi, two leaders who were developing nuclear weapons, gave them up at a certain point, and then were ultimately were vulnerable to American pressure. But do you think it's just that determined? Uh, deter I mean, to act, or does he want to have nuclear capability to become an increasing bully around the world? Yeah, so there's, there's, there's two reasons that everybody agrees with, right? One is he wants them to deter us from attacking him, right. and he needs them politically at home because he has told his people, we're under threat from the United States, this is the way to protect ourselves, this is going to be my legacy to you, right? We so it's important him politically. The one possibility that people are just starting to discuss is does he want these weapons to try to coerce the United States and South Korea? So in other words, once he has them, will he be more aggressive on the Korean Peninsula? And the question is, how do you deter that? And that's more difficult. Is there a viable military option that is not catastrophic? So I don't believe so. Um, and it's not viable from two perspectives. One is, I don't think there's a military option that can achieve the president's objective of destroying all the nuclear weapons and all the missiles. They simply can't get to them all for reasons I can't talk about, right? Mm -hmm. The other is there's not a military option that I know of that doesn't have a high likelihood of resulting in a second Korean War, possible of missile attacks on Guam and Japan, and possibly even missile attacks on the United States of America. But Evan, they seem prepared for catastrophe. The one military guy you were walking around with said, push us, push us hard, we will not die alone. That it was is, very scary. It's very much part of their self-image. Yeah. They see themselves as survivors. All right, Evan and Michael, always good to see you. Good to see you guys. Thanks. At our table.